وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونريد أن نمن على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ونجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم الوارثين صل على محمد وآل محمد A hadith that is unanimously accepted by all Muslims is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi tells the Muslims من مات ولم يعرف إمام زمانه مات ميتة جاهلية He who dies without knowing the Imam, the leader of his time dies the death of the Jahiliyyah, meaning dies the death of the pagans before the religion of Islam. And from this hadith, there are many concepts that are derived, many ideas that are understood. First is the role and the importance of the imamah and the leadership, because every time it has an imam, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi relates the imamah. If someone does not know their imam, then this person is as if they are a pagan. It's as if they have not accepted all of their religion. And this is not a strange idea because the religion and the faith was complete on the day of Ghadir after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi appointed Amir al-Mu'mineen, the verse came down, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum. So the faith is complete through imamah. And this hadith, it also proves a very important point, very important principles in the religion of Islam, and that is the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The justice of Allah dictates that there has to be an imam during every time. If I believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is adil, if I believe that Allah is just, I have to believe that there is a leader for every single time. Because it goes against the justice of Allah. This is a logical proof for the imamah. It goes against the justice of Allah for Allah to leave the people without a leader, without a representative, without a guide at one point of the time. And this is why we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times, ever since the creation of the human being, Allah says, Inni ja'alun fil ardi khalifa. I have placed a vicegerent, I have placed a khalifa on earth. Someone that could represent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah has appointed imams and leaders at all times. There is no time that there was no leader and there was no imam. And these are imams that call 
people towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that invite people towards worshipping Allah and believing in Allah. وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ وَإِقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِيْتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ وَكَانُوا لَنَا عَابِدِينَ These are the imams that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to mankind so that they guide by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they bring people back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is from the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it does not make sense for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to leave people without a leader. On the, day, on the day of judgment, we can tell Allah, Oh Allah, you sent us. We were here, but there was no one to show us the way. And that will be a hujjah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in order for the hujjah to be complete, He sent proofs. He sent the prophets and he sends the, he sends the imams and the awliyas. And the hujjah is at many levels. At an internal level, every single one of us, we have a nafs al ammarah Every single one of us, we have a part of our soul that is telling us to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah at the internal level, He has also placed the fitrah. He has also placed that consciousness, that primordial consciousness that tells us to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that there's a balance at the internal level. <coughs> at the internal level, we have a nafs al-ammara, but Allah has placed the fitrah. And at the external level, there are the desires and there's shaitan that is bringing people away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in order for there to be a balance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends imams and guides and messengers to counter the shaitan and to counter the influence of the external influences that bring us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those are the imams that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. And we are living in a time where we also do have an imam. And that Imam is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon all of humanity. وَنُرِيدُ أَن نَمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we want to bless and we want to bestow upon the ones who have been oppressed, the ones who are the believers, the mu'mineen, Eventually, we will make them the a'immah, the imams. And they will be the warathin, they will be the inheritors on earth. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, نَحْنُ mustadafun. We are the ones who our rights were taken from us. We are the ones who our haq was taken from us. And this concept, this ideology of believing in an imam, at all times, and believing in an imam that will save humanity at the end of times, this is not something that only we the Muslims believe in. This is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all humanity. And we see that the Jews, they talk about this concept, the Savior. The Christians, they talk about this. I've even read in other scriptures, the Buddhist and Hindu, Books, they also talk about a savior at the end of times. So you see that all are united. And Allah says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ This promise of a savior at the end of time, this is not something that only we the Shias believe in. Not something that only the Muslims believe in. This is something that Allah has promised in the Zabur, in the Psalms of David, in the Bible, in the Injil, in the Torah. The promise of a savior at the end of time is a promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that all religions, all monotheistic religions believe in. وَنُرِيدُ أَن نَمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْبَرَضِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised all of the religions that at the end of time, there will be a savior. 
And we see that that Savior is Imam Al-Hujjah Al-Mahdi Al-Muntadar Al-Mawud. The one, the promised Savior from Al-Muhammad who will bring peace and justice to earth after it has been filled with oppression and tyranny. And this is the promise of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the promise in the Quran. And we believe that Imam Al-Hujjah will rise with Nabiullah Isa, with Prophet Isa alayhi salam. And Rasulullah tells the Muslims, كَيْفَ أَنْتُمْ إِذْ نَزَلَ بْنُ مَرْيَمْ وَفِيكُ وَإِمَامُكُمْ مِنْكُمْ How will you be when the son of Mary comes down and your Imam, the Imam that will lead the prayer, the one that even Isa will pray behind, will be from you, the Muslims. And that is Imam al-Hujjah, ajjalallahu ta'ala, farajah al-Sharif. And we believe that the time that the Imam reappears, that will be a time where all of the religions will be united. Because the Christians, they believe in Jesus, and they will see Jesus is with Imam al-Mahdi. And the Jews, they're waiting for the Messiah to come, even though he did come. Isa is the Messiah. However, they are waiting for the Messiah to come. Once they see Jesus, they will see that he is the Messiah. And he will also be with Imam al-Mahdi. And the believers of the Muslims, you see that all of the believers of the Tawheed, the believers of the Abrahamic religions, they will all be united under the banner of the grandson of Ibrahim, Imam al-Mahdi, عَجَّلَ ta'ala فَرَجَهُ الشَّرِيفِ رَحْمَ اللَّهُ مَنْ ذَاكِرَ الْقَائِمَ مِنْ آلِ مُحَمَّدٍ Now, this belief system that we have regarding Imam al-Hujjah, there are many that have come and brought some questions and they have some criticism regarding the belief that we have in Imam al-Hujjah. One of the main criticisms that today you hear and unfortunately you hear it from people who are Muslims. They've read the Quran. They have heard the hadith of Rasulullah. They know they're not far from the truth. But yet you see that they are the first to criticize this idea. And that is the ghaybah, the occultation of Imam al-Hujjah, ajjalallahu ta'ala, farajahu sharif Some people, they say it's difficult to comprehend. How can someone be in a state of occultation for over a thousand years? Why is Imam al-Hujjah in an occultation? How can we benefit from the Imam when he is in an occultation? And these are questions, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. However, when we ask questions, we have to open our hearts and open our minds and we have to always go back to the Qur'an. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says in a hadith, إِذَا الْتَبَسَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْأُمُورُ كَقَطْعَ اللَّيْلِ الْمُظْلِمْ فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِالْقُرْآنِ فَإِنَّهُ شَافِعٌ مُشَفَّعٌ Oh, you people, if you see that matters are so dark in front of you, you cannot tell the truth, resort to the Qur'an. Go back to the Qur'an. You will find the solution within the Qur'an. You will find the answer within the Qur'an. Of course, taking the tafsir of the Qur'an from the rightful sources. Yesterday we spoke about taking the literal meaning of the Qur'an and how it could mislead people. Taking the tafsir of the Qur'an from the right sources, from the Ahlul Bayt, and from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Now we go back to the Qur'an, we see that the occultation, the ghaybah, is not a strange theory. It's nothing new. It's not something new that is happening within the Muslims and with, on earth with the messengers that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent. You look in the Qur'an, you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a story of Ashab al-Kahf, the people of the cave. How many years were they asleep for? Over 300 years. They were asleep. They were in a ghaybah. Ghaybah means hidden from the eyes. They were in an occultation from the people. 
But by the permission of Allah, they were alive and they came back. And they were alive after that long sleep. This is one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Prophet Musa. How many times did Prophet Musa disappear from his people? He was hidden from his people. Now we know he was alive because the Quran tells us he was alive. But the people during his time, the first time where he escaped from Egypt and he went to Madain, he was gone for over 10 years. People thought he was dead. People did not believe in him. They thought he was gone, that's it. Even though he was a promised savior for that time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised that that time there will be a prophet that will save Bani Israel from Fir'aun. Musa, in another time, he also disappeared. One time he goes to the Miqat. They tell, they tell him, وَوَاعَدْنَا مُوسَىٰ ثَلَاثِينَ لَيْلَةً وَأَتْمَمْنَاهَا بِعَشْرٍ He told his people we're going to go for 30 days to the Miqat so that we speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 30 days passed and Musa did not come back. Many people did not believe in him because he took 10 days longer. وَأَتْمَمْنَاهَا بِعَشْرٍ It became 40 days. Many people, they stopped believing in Musa. They said he's a liar. Musa is not truthful. After all the miracles that they saw, after all of the proofs that they saw, how he saved them, how he brought the proof for them, and many of the miracles, many people turned against him. Now we could comprehend because many people, they stopped believing in Musa and he had left Harun. He left his brother Harun with Bani Israel. They started worshiping the calf. And they turned against Musa and they turned against Tawheed. Now we can comprehend the hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi tells Ali ibn Abi Talib, Anta minni bi manzilati Haruna min Musa illa annahu la nabiyya min ba'di. You to me are like Harun was to Musa, except you are not a prophet. You see how Harun was betrayed. You see how Harun was neglected the same way Ali ibn Abi Talib was neglected. And the Quran also gives us a clear example. If I'm a Muslim, I have to believe in the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, do, are Muslims in disagreement with where Isa is? Isn't Isa in occultation right now? Isn't Isa, Jesus, in a state of ghaibah right now? Jesus is not dead. Jesus is still alive. Allah raised him, but he is not dead. And he is in a state of occultation. So how can I understand and comprehend and believe that Isa is in occultation and I refuse to believe that Imam al-Mahdi is in occultation? If I believe in Isa, why do I not believe in Imam al-Hujjah? Why is that difficult to comprehend? If I say, how could someone live for such a long time? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us proof in the Quran of Nuh. Allah says Nuh lived amongst his people for, he was with his people for 950 years. So if it's someone cannot live that long, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can extend the person's life where they could live for a longer life. And when we look at the Qur'an, we see that the issue of Imam al-Mahdi is very much related with the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You look at the birth of Imam al-Hujjah, you see that his birth was a hidden birth. Suddenly overnight, his mother realized, not just his mother, she realized that she was pregnant. Now you go and you look at the Qur'an, you see that the same thing happened with the mother of Musa. The same thing happened, her, her birth was a hidden birth. Fir'aun, there were prophecies that told him that there was going to be a person that will be born from Bani Israel that will be the reason for his demise. So he began to kill all of the children of Bani Israel. Any woman who was pregnant, he would abort her child. And he would kill the child within her stomach. But Prophet Musa 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to protect him. And he even went in the house of Fir'aun and he was protected in the home of Fir'aun. Isn't this a miracle? Now, if I believe that the birth of Musa was a hidden birth and a protected birth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him until he grew older. Why is it difficult for me to believe that the grandson of Rasulullah is also the same? Who is the savior of humanity, who is promised in all of the books. So we see that Imam al-Hujjah is very much related with all of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You look at Nuh, his long life. You look at Musa, his birth. You look at Isa, his occultation. And you look at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Imam al-Hujjah, he has the mercy and the rahmah from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now someone might ask, why did the Imam go into occultation? The answer is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to protect the life of the Imam so that the message can be protected. Just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to protect the life of Imam Zayn al Abidin on a day where all of Bani Hashim, all of the men were killed. It was a miracle that one man who was the son of Imam, who was the son of Imam al Hussein. They kill even the six-month-old child, but they do not touch Imam Zayn al-Abideen. Isn't this a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in order to carry on the message, he protects the life of Imam al-Hujjah. Because at that time, because of the numerous ahadith, numerous narrations from Rasulullah, where he says, that there will be a Mahdi, there will be a Ma'ud, there will be a Savior. He is the 12th, he's from the sons of Fatima. These are nothing. We have many narrations that speak about this. So you look at the Khalifa at that time, they had their eyes and they had spies in the house of Imam al Hassan al Askari. And they brought Imam al Hadi all the way from Medina to Samarra. Why? So that they could monitor the house of the Imams because they know that there will be a child who will be born and he will be the savior of mankind. They had eyes and they had spies in the houses of the Imams. Imam al-Hadi, he was brought all the way from Medina to Samarra so that the Khalifa at that time could watch the Imam. The day the Imam al-Hadi passes away, they had spies in the house. The day Imam al Hassan al Askari passed away, the house was filled with spies. They were monitoring that house of the Imam so that they could see where is that Mahdi al Mahud. They knew that there was, it's going to be the 12th one. And of course, another, another relationship with Bani Israel and another relationship with, with Isa alayhi salam. You come and you look at Isa. How many disciples did he have? He had 12 disciples. You look at Musa, how many tribes were there? How many sons did Ya'qub have? 12 sons. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he also says, there are 12 Imams after me. You see that there is a correlation and a relationship because the message ultimately is one and it all calls for Tawheed and it all calls for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed the Imam in an occultation, in a ghaybah, to protect the life of the Imam. And of course there's a master plan. Many times we say, why doesn't something happen the, the time that we want? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has a master plan. I'm only living in this life, a very short period. But there's a greater plan, and that is the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to submit to that plan. Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he was lost with the, in the desert with his people, Bani Israel. For 40 years he was lost. They were traveling, they were just traveling, they would not find a place. Prophet Musa, he does a dua. He asks Allah, oh Allah, save us. Allah replied to him immediately, your dua has been accepted. But when was the dua accepted? 40 years later. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has His own way. Because Allah knows what's best for us. Allah knows when is the right time and He will send the Imam at the right time and at the right moment. So we should not lose faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, someone comes and asks, how can I benefit from the Imam? If the Imam is hidden, if the Imam is not around, how do I benefit from him? And this is a very important question. Many people, they ask this question. We see that according to the Quran and according to the ahadith, the narrations of Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt, that we benefit from the Imam in many ways. Some are direct and some are indirect. One of the most direct ways that we are benefiting from the Imam is a hadith that says, لَوْلَ الْحُجَّةِ لَسَاخَةِ الْأَرْضُ بِأَهْلِهَا If it's not for the hujjah, what's the purpose of life? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it does not make sense. It goes back to the first point that we were, that we were speaking about. It goes against the justice of Allah to create people without sending a teacher for them. So what's the purpose of life if there's no teacher? This is why the hadith says, لَوْلَ الْحُجَّةِ لَسَاخَةِ الْأَرْضُ بِأَهْلِهَا If there's no proof of Allah on earth, then who's going, to be, who's going to guide these people? So there's no point of life carrying on. So the Imam, he is the reason for our existence. لَوْلَ الْحُجَّةِ لَسَاخَةِ الْأَرْضُ بِأَهْلِهَا And he is the hujjah of Allah on earth. He is the proof of Allah on earth because he is Baqiyatullah. One day, a man came to Imam Sadiq alayhi salam and he tells him, how should I say salam to Imam al-Hujjah? Because Imam Sadiq and Rasulullah and Amir al-Mu'mineen, all of the Imams, they used to speak about Imam al-Hujjah. And they used to tell the people that there's going to be an occultation, a ghayba, that many people will lose their way and they will be lost. They will be led astray just like sheep without a shepherd. So one of the companions of Imam Sadiq, he tells the Imam, when the Imam appears, how should I say salam to him? Should I tell him, As-salamu alayka ya amir al-mu'mineen? Should I say, peace be upon you, O commander of the faithful? Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he says, no, that is the title for Ali ibn Abi Talib. He is the only Amir al mumineen But if you say salam to him, you say, As-salamu alayka ya baqiyat Allahi fi ardih. Peace be upon you, or remaining proof of Allah. Because Allah says in the Quran, Baqiyatullahi khayrun lakum in kuntum mu'mineen. So we send our salams to the Imam because he is the proof of Allah. And because he is the proof of Allah, life carries on. In one hadith, in one letter, the Imam, he used to write letters during the smaller occultation, during the Ghayb al-Sughra. He writes a letter to his people, to his followers. They tell him, how do we benefit from you? He says, you benefit from me just like you benefit from the sun on a cloudy day. We need the sun to survive. We need the sun for life to carry on. But when it's cloudy, just because I do not see it, it does not mean that I do not benefit from the sun. Do I need to see the leader in order to benefit from the leader? No. There are many ways that we can benefit from the leader. From our Imam. Some are direct and some are indirect ways. According to the traditions, the Imam, he carries out some tasks. He carries out tasks and he performs dua for the followers, for the mu'mineen. If it's not for the dua of the Imam, where would we be today? It's the dua of the Imam who is praying for us. The Imam... According to one verse in the Quran, he is a witness, he sees us. Allah says in the Quran, وَقُلْ اَعْمَلُوا Act. فَسَيَرَ اللَّهِ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ Act, because Allah will see your actions. Rasulullah sees your actions. Don't say Rasulullah is dead and he does not see my actions. The Quran says Rasulullah sees your actions. 
wal mu'minun. Here, the imams, they say that al mu'minun. Here, it refers to the imam. The mu'minun refers to the imam of the time. And they would come and they would ask Imam Sadiq for a proof of an imam. How do you prove the imamah? Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, he would tell his companions, Ihtajju alayhim. If you want to argue the imamah with people that do not believe the imamah, Ihtajju alayhim bi laylatul qadr. Tell them about laylatul qadr. Doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that the angels come down on laylatul qadr? Who do the angels come down upon? During the time of Rasulullah, they used to come down upon Rasulullah. Who did they come down upon after Rasulullah? Do they come down upon anyone who comes and says, I'm a Khalifa? Or do they come down upon someone who is appointed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And that is the hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Laylatul Qadr, it is a proof for the Imam. The angels, they come down upon the Imam on Laylatul Qadr, and he sees our actions. Allah says in the Quran, فَسَيَرَ اللَّهَ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ And also, there are many indirect ways that we benefit from the Imam, but we don't realize. Today, how do we have all these mosques? How do we have all these mosques and institutions? How do we have the Hawza that is spreading the religion, that is spreading the madhab of the Ahlul Bayt? How does the funding come to all these institutions? It comes from Sahm al-Imam. It comes from the money that belongs to the Imam. We build our mosques with Sahm al-Imam. We help our institutions, our religious institutions that help the faith grow and help our institutions grow from the money of the Imam, Sahm al-Imam. When we pay our homes, a portion of that goes to the Imam. So we are benefiting from the Imam. When you are sitting in this masjid, this masjid, it was built and it was purchased by money, many of it had to do with Sahm al-Imam. You are benefiting from the Imam. How do you say, how do I not, how do I benefit from the Imam when you are sitting in a place and you are praying in a place that is purchased with the money that belongs to the Imam? Another institution that we have, the institution of Marja'iya, our scholars, our ulama. Today you look at our ulama throughout history, you see that if we did not have Maraji', the Shias would have been perished. The Shias would have been wiped out. It was the decisions and the fatwas of our scholars, our ulama that saved the tashayyu. You look in Iraq, when there was colonialism, there was a, 19, a revolution, a rebellion in 1920. Who was the one that saved the Shias? It was the ulama that issued the fatwa. Right now, last year, who was the one that issued the fatwa? It was the ulama, the marajah. In Lebanon, who was the one that saved the Muslims and the Shias from the occupation? It was the ulama. In Iran, who was the one that brought Islam and helped Islam grow? It was the ulama. The maraja. These maraja, where do they take their authority from? They take their authority because they are the representatives of the imam. If they're not the representative of the imam, no one's going to listen to them. No Shia is going to listen to them. But because the marja is the naib imam he is the representative of the imam, we listen to him. And if it was not for these scholars, if it was not for these pious scholars, today we the Shias, we, have, we would have been perished. And you see that our ulama, they are respected. You compare them with the others, you see that the politicians, they come and visit our ulama. They come and visit our maraja. Where you see others, the the maraja and the scholars and the mufti, they are the ones who are going after the politicians. This is all from the imam. This is all an indirect way where we are benefiting from the imam of our time. But you see many people, many people they are benefiting and they're eating from the money that belongs to the imam and they question the imam. They say, how do I benefit from the imam? When he is taking the money that belongs to the imam himself. 
Or many people, they question, they attack our scholars and our marja'iyah. And then they come and they say, how are we benefiting from the imam? This is the, the marja is a representative of the imam. And then there's also another way that we benefit from the imam of our time. That could be an indirect way. Maybe there are many times that the imam does du'a for his people. He does du'a for people. Maybe he does something behind the scenes that I do not realize. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an example for this in the Quran. Prophet Khidr alayhi salam. Musa was with Khidr. Khidr, he builds a wall. And then he goes and he kills a person. And then he makes a hole in a, in a boat that they're riding. It all seems very strange. But then Khidr explains that I did this for a reason. I built the wall because there was money that was hidden that belonged to orphans. In order to protect the orphans, I built that wall there. I sunk the ship. I, he did not sink the ship. He made a hole in the ship because there was a king that was taking all of the boats and all of the ships that belonged to people. And the owners of that ship, they were good people. So the king, he sees that there's a hole in that. He does not take it. He kills a person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give his parents who are mu'mineen, who are believers, a righteous son who will be a father of prophets. This is a story in the Qur'an. If I believe in the Qur'an, then I believe that there are some of the awliya, some of the knowledgeable ones who were sent by Allah, they do some things behind the scenes. If I believe that Khidr can do such a thing, why is it difficult for me to believe that Al-Mahdi Al-Maw'ud, Imam Al-Hujjah does not do such a thing? So, this is the role of the Imam. Now, a final question, what is our role? What is my job? Many times we sit and we question when the Imam will come, what will happen, why is there a ghaybah, why is there occultation? How We ask so many questions, but never once do I ask, what have I done for the Imam? Never once do I ask, what is my job right now? What does he expect from me now? We always say, how do I expect from the Imam? Never once do we say, what does the Imam expect from me? What is our role? One of the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, من أفضل أعمال أمتي انتظار الفرج From the best actions of my ummah is to wait for the faraj. Now what does it mean to wait? Do I just sit and wait, look at my watch? Like I'm waiting for someone? No, it means that we anticipate the arrival of the Imam. We prepare ourselves for the Imam. When you have a guest coming to your house, do you just sit and wait? Or you go and you prepare? You go and you make sure that everything is ready when the Imam comes, when your guest comes. What have we done? Let me ask myself, what have I done as an individual for the Imam to come? This is a very important question. The Imams, they teach us how to strengthen our relationship with the Imam of our time. One of the ways is to perform the nudbah. The nudbah, it's a tearful dua, crying, remembering the Imam, bringing our heart with the Imam. Let me put myself in the shoes of the Imam. What is he feeling right now? Where is he right now? We gather, we laugh, we sit with our friends, we sit with our family. Where is the Imam right now? He is amongst us. He is watching us. But who is there with him? He is remembering the miseries and the tragedies that took place. And he is a witness. He is a witness to the oppression that's taking place for his followers, for the religion of Islam, for humanity. <laughs> we have to connect ourselves with the Imam of our time just like the way the Imams before him, his fathers, 
Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he used to cry when he remembers Imam al-Hujjah. And he is his great, great grandfather. Imam al-Rada, the other Imams, they used to cry when they remember Imam al-Hujjah and the ghaybah that the mu'mineen will go through, the difficulties that the mu'mineen will go through. One day, one of the companions of Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he walked in on Imam al-Sadiq. He saw the Imam crying. Crying and saying, Sayyidi, ghaybatuka nafat riqadi. Oh my master, your bait, your occultation, it has taken away all of my rest. وضيقت علي مهادي وأسرت مني راحة فؤادي. Your ghaybah, the Imam, Imam al-Sadiq, he cries for the ghaybah of Imam al-Hujjah, عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف. And another, and another dua, dua in nudbah, that dua that we are asked, the Imam, Imam al-Hujjah himself, he asks his Shias to recite that dua. The dua says, إِلَى مَتَى أَحَارُ فِيكَ يَا مَوْلَاي وَإِلَى مَتَى وَأَيُّ خِطَابٍ أَصِفُ فِيكَ وَأَيُّ نَجْوَى عَزِيزٌ عَلَيَّ أَنْ أُجَابَ دُونَكَ وَأُنَاغَى عَزِيزٌ عَلَيَّ أَنْ أَبْكِيَكَ وَيَخْذُلُكَ الْوَرَى عزيز علي أن يجري عليك دونهم ما جرى هل من معين فأطيل معه العويل والبكاء هل من جزوع فأساعد جزعه إذا خلا the Imams, they teach us to cry for Imam al-Hujjah. In one part of the dua, one part of dua in nudbah, the Imam, he cries for the events that are taking place. And where is the Imam? He is waiting for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him permission to reappear. Aina mu'izzul awliya wa mudillul a'da أين باب الله الذي منه يؤتى أين وجه الله الذي إليه يتوجه الأولياء And then the dua continues until the Imam says أين الطالب بدحول الأنبياء وأبناء الأنبياء and the children of the prophets and then he says أين الطالب بدم المقتول بكربلاء where is the one that will avenge Abba Abdullah the one who was killed in Karbala do you know why there is a red flag over the dome of Abba Abdullah the red flag symbolizes that this person has been killed and no one has taken vengeance for his murder. This is why we wait for the Imam to reappear so that he takes vengeance for Imam al-Hujjah al-Jalallahu ta'ala farajahu al-Sharif. And the Imam is connected to Imam al-Hujjah. Imam al-Hujjah is connected to Imam al hussein And this is why the narrations, they say that the day his movement will launch, it will be the day of Ashura. And the first thing that he will do, the first thing that he will do is that he will cry and hold a majlis for his grandfather, Abba Abdullah. He will hold that child that child that was killed, the son of Imam al Hussein, and he would say, وَإِذَا الْمَوْعُودَةُ سُئِلَتْ بِأَيِّ ذَنْبٍ قُتِلَتْ My dear brothers and sisters, we have to connect with the Imam of our time, who on days like this he cries when he remembers Imam al Hujjah in Ziyarat al Nahiyah. He says, يَا جَدَّا 
لئن أثرتني الدهور وعاقني عن نصرك المقدور ولم أكن لمن حاربك محاربا ولمن نصب لك العدا مناصبا فلا أندبنك صباحا ومساء ولا أبكين عليك بدل الدموع دما أو أبا عبد الله أو grandfather if I was not able to support you on the day of Ashura if I was not able to help you I cry for you day and night and I cry for you blood oh Abba Abdullah my dear brothers and sisters on a night like this we remember Ali Al-Akbar the son of Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam Ali Al-Akbar he was the first of Bani Hashim to go out and fight he was the first he asked his father for, for permission Imam Al-Hussein alayhi salam he began to cry how can he stop his son from fighting when he has allowed others to go and fight? But Imam al Hussein, he did a dua against Umar ibn Sa'd. He raised his hand to the sky and he said, Ya ibn Sa'd, qata Allah rahimak kama qata'ta rahimi wa lam ta'fad qarabati min Rasulillah. Allahumma shad alayhim. فقد برز إليهم غلاما أشبه الناس خلقا وخلقا ومنطقا بنبيك وكنا إذا اشتقنا إلى نبيك نظرنا إليه Ali al-Akbar he goes out to fight and he introduces himself أنا علي بن الحسين بن علي نحن وبيت الله أولى بالنبي الله لا يحكم فينا ابن الدعي أضرب بالسيف أحامي عن أبي ضرب غلام هاشمي علوي علي الأكبر fights courageously he, he kills many of them he reminds them of the bravery of his grandfather أمير المؤمنين علي بن أبي طالب until suddenly Ali al-Akbar returns to Imam al-Hussein. He returns to the Imam but he is very thirsty. He tells the Imam, Oh Abba Abdullah, the thirst is killing me. I cannot fight with this thirst. Imam al-Hussein, he tells him, Oh Ali, feel my tongue. He felt the tongue of Imam al-Hussein. He saw that the tongue of Imam al-Hussein was as dry as a piece of wood. Imam al-Hussein was also thirsty. He tells him, Oh my dear son Ali, go and fight and Rasulullah will be the first to quench your thirst. يا بويا شربة مية الجبدي أتقوى ورد للميدان وحدي يا فوق يا بويا فطر قلبي وحب جدي علي الأكبر he goes out he fights courageously until a man by the name of Al Murrah ibn Munqid al Abdi he stabs Ali al Akbar with a spear in his back. Ali al Akbar he falls towards the horse. The horse, the eyes of the horse are covered. The horse keeps going towards the enemies. They keep attacking him. They keep hitting him with the sword. The hadith says, They cut him up into pieces while Imam al Hussein is watching. Ali al Akbar he calls out, Ya Abu Alayka minni salam. Fahada jaddi Rasulullah. Laqad sakani bi kaysi al awfa. Imam al Hussein he rushes to Ali al Akbar. The hadith says that Imam al Hussein he throws himself on the body of Ali al Akbar. He begins to cry as he remembers Ali al Akbar and he says, Ya Ali, ala dunya ba'dak al Abba, Ali, life is not worth living after you. Imam al Hussein was crying so much, Bani Hajj, he could not carry Ali al Akbar back. 
يقاص بني هاشم او بني هاشم يحملوا اخاكم علي they come and they carry him and they place him in the tent قاعد عنده وشاف مغمض العين بدم مسابح مترب الخدين متواصل طبر والراس للصين They bring Ali Al-Akbar to the tent The woman Zainab, Layla, the aunt of Zainab They welcome Ali Al-Akbar But he is brought up, cut up into pieces Yahl al-Khiyam jahakum Ali Gumula Ushufu ala sadri jnazita لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون يا الله My dear brothers and sisters the day of Ashura is coming very close let us ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the love of Imam al-Husayn, by the children of Imam al-Husayn, by the position of Imam al-Husayn, any hajah, anything that you have, ask Allah right now. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to answer your du'as. And the most important du'a that we all have to ask is for Allah to hasten the reappearance of the Imam of our time. اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله يا الله يا رحمن يا رحيم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأمقات تابع اللهم بيننا وبينهم بالخيرات إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك غافر الخطيئات إنك على كل شيء قدير let us also conclude with this dua for Imam al hujjah Everyone stand, remember the Imam of your time. Allahumma kulli waliyika al-hujjah ibn al-Hasan Salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai Fi hadhi al-sa'a wa fi kulli وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على محمد وعلى آله الطاهرين